the thing that I love about McKinsey reports is not only the quality of their analysis, but actually you're, you have a sort of unfailing ability to come up with catchy phrases. So, you know, the U.S. needs high skill, high share, high spark, high speed. And may I suggest that this discussion has to focus on the latter, high speed, <laughs> since we have a lot to cover in not very much time. Um, there's so much to talk about. Where should we start? I think, Andy, I'm going to start with you. You've spent, you know... I, was, I wanted to say a lifetime looking at the American labor market and being part of it, but I, that may be slightly exaggerated. But you know, from your perspective, how do you react to this report? And does it accurately, do you think, depict the challenge facing American workers in the American labor market? I mean, what I'd say is, is this report is an important roadmap, and it comes at a pretty important historical moment. I like to say this is not our father's or our grandfather's economy. James asked whether this is something fundamental is happening. Differently, I'd say something revolutionary is happening differently because I happen to believe this will, history will say this is the third economic revolution in world history. And as opposed to a 3,000 year agricultural transition or a 300 year industrial, we are having a three year, 30 year massive transformation with an enormous amount of creative <laughs> destruction. And so I think what we now know is <clears throat> the economy works differently, the markets work differently. Business cycles work differently, and we're not going to go into the future looking in the rearview mirror. So this is a unique moment of history, and so we need to think about this fundamental point. Uh, market fundamentalism is no longer a way or worshiping markets a, a way forward. You know, strict government intervention is not a way forward. In the third economic revolution, countries are teams. Teams have plans. Germany has a plan. China has a plan. Singapore has a plan. The USA has no plan. And what the roadmap is, is one of, is an attempt to try to make a plan at a unique moment of history. And so all I'd say is Team USA, if we love this country like I do, needs leadership and it needs a plan and this is a good place to start. Excellent. Well, that's a rather uplifting start. Laura, I just wanted to push uh, a little bit more because I was struck, as perhaps many of you were, in the distinction, the difference perhaps between what Austin was saying earlier on in the discussion and the tone of this report, which is, you know, Let's say, I think you, James, said conventional wisdom is that, you know, when the growth comes, the jobs will come. And the, the tone of this report seems to be that the growth may come, but the jobs won't necessarily come. How do you, Laura, see that? Do you think, and let's not have a semantic debate about jobless recovery or not, but has something <laughs> fundamental changed? Well, I think actually the, the, there is not the inconsistency that there appears at first sight. Because I think if you look at the uh, report, it lays out three scenarios. And the scenarios actually are high growth, low growth, medium growth. Those are underlying those are assumptions about the growth of the economy. They're about the growth of demand. They're about the growth of household income. They're about the growth of consumption. Uh, they're about the growth of investment. So I don't think it's either or. Basically what the report is saying that if we manage to get a high growth economy. We will see jobs of these numbers in these sectors. The question is, what does that require from the skill base uh, so that those jobs can be filled? So I, I see it as the supply and demand working together. I don't see it as an inconsistency. Um, I, I do think that uh, Austin raised a couple of things which I think are also not explicit in this report, but actually very connected to it. He talked about the fact that this is a time where we're switching from government support for an economy which was in a free fall. We're handing off back to the private sector. So this is a report and the discussion is about what can the private sector do to uh, stimulate demand, to create uh, new jobs. And then the second thing uh, that's very important here as we think about policy, and we can get to that later, is that Austin also said that we have to think about as we hand this off to the private sector, we can see certain ways that the government can be extremely helpful here. Getting out of the way in terms of permitting regulation would be a regulatory thing. Helping to provide the skills the workforce needs can be a positive thing. Building a supportive infrastructure, another positive thing. So I think the notion of we're gonna to have to change from the public to the private, change the composition of demand, not so dependent on consumption, more on investment and exports, and then change what government policy can do to help the private sector, that's really brings it all together. I think the report and what Austin said complement one another. And Carl, you know, you're a Fortune 500 CEO. Do you see this skill mismatch in your day-to-day -day activities? And, and do you think that is the big problem that, that McKinsey rightly points out? 
Yeah, I think both as, an, <coughs> excuse me, both as an employer as well as those who provide employees to other companies, skills mismatch is, is extensive and more widespread than uh, hits the popular literature. We always think of a skills mismatch in terms of engineering as an example, and it's there. Uh, we only generally have one candidate for about every three jobs that we have available in the engineering space. But that story hides the fact that in the skills trades area and the technicians of all sorts and the uh, everything from electricians to plumbers to x-ray techs, you, you know, you pick the area, there's a tremendous shortage. Uh, we at Kelly usually have tens of thousands of open orders that are available in those, in those zones that you can't find people for. So I think the skills mismatch is huge. I think we're doing very little uh, in terms of either national education policy or down to uh, very specific policies at state levels to guide individuals into the areas where jobs are currently available or are going to be available. And also the amount of time it takes to retrain people to reskill individuals is just way too long. Uh, we have got to get much better at faster retooling, reskilling of individuals. If somebody's been unemployed for two years, we can't expect them to go back to college for two years, you know, post that in order to be able to get a job. That's just bad social policy. I, I, I'm going to turn on because I think we'll want to spend a lot of time talking about what are the shortcomings in retraining. But just before we do that, the sort of second component of thinking about how you match demand and supply uh, in, in the future is where is that demand going to be? And one of the interesting points that this report made, again, in contrast to Austin Goolsby, seemed to be somewhat more skeptical, the two of you, that the that job growth would be there in manufacturing. And uh, Austin seemed to think much more optimistically about that. Now, Martin, you've, you've done a lot of work on manufacturing. You've thought about manufacturing. What's your take on, you know, and I think there really is a tension here. So what are the prospects for manufacturing job growth? Uh, I think the report is right and Austin is wrong, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I, I think there may be a, a manufacturing renaissance in the sense that uh, output growth in manufacturing uh, will be uh, stronger going forward. It actually never was that bad. Uh, output growth continued um, in, in the past 20 years or, or going back. Uh, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of strong manufacturing companies. There's a lot of innovation going on in the, in the United States. Uh, I think there's, that on the output side, yes, there likely will be a, a manufacturing renaissance. I think it's also the case that, that some of the economics, as the report itself says, some of the economics, the, the uh, slide that was shown was the one for call centers, uh, but I think it's also true for some manufacturing activities too, that companies are finding the, that having a supply chain spread out all around the world is more difficult to deal with. Uh, than they thought it was going to be. Maybe the savings they're getting from doing that aren't as great. So I think there are signs, and we heard of companies that were bringing uh, production back uh, to the U.S. Um, I think the skills issue uh, is, is important on that, and we're going to talk uh, more about. Uh, the number of uh, jobs that are going to be in manufacturing does depend a little bit on how successful we are in, in uh, creating people with the skills that are attractive to employers to actually then go and provide more skills to them. Uh, obviously, a lot of uh, companies will do their own training, but they want to have uh, workers that they, uh, that they can train. Um, one of the other reasons I think we can be somewhat optimistic about manufacturing is the value of the dollar. Uh, in my own work, that is uh, really the main thing uh, that drives whether we have a big trade deficit or whether we have something uh, close to the balance. I don't want to get into all the macroeconomics of it and are we going to balance the budget and have more saving domestically, but as on the assumption that the economy recovers and we get back towards full employment, are we going to have an unbalanced uh, uh, economy with lots of trade deficit or are we going to have a more balanced growth path? A lot depends on uh, the policies we follow, uh, whether we have enough domestic saving, uh, whether the value of the dollar is uh, uh, at, a, at a point that makes U.S. Uh, competitive. All right, so why, why don't we uh, get the jobs? Well, the numbers just don't add up. I thought they were going to, and that's something that I learned from the team or working with the, uh, the McKinsey group, that if you look at what's likely to be the growth of output, so you look at uh, what's, uh, we haven't stopped buying things, so America's still buying lots of things, um, 
we think that exports may do better going forward. So if, if we get something closer to trade balance to 10 years from now rather than a huge trade deficit, that will add to output growth. So you put the output growth together and you say, okay, how much is productivity going to rise? Uh, so you don't know, obviously, it could be very slow. We could, could get a, a surprise there. But if you look at historically what productivity has been in, in manufacturing, and then you match that with what, what is likely to be the output growth, and you just don't get that there's going to be net job creation over the next 10 years. It's very hard to make those numbers come out. And there's certainly plenty of adverse scenarios. Uh, we don't deal with the, the saving imbalance. We end up with a, still having a big trade deficit. Uh, productivity actually turns out to be a little faster than, than, uh, than we thought it was going to be in which you would continue uh, to lose jobs in manufacturing. So um, much as I would like to agree with uh, Austin, I, I, I think it's hard to get the numbers to come out that way. God, I'm now even more depressed. Well, so the, the only <laughs> thing I would add, Zanny, is that, um, you know, there is a, uh, this is a 10-year view, and there is a short-term view. Manufacturing yeah. has been adding jobs yeah. um, in, in the past few months and could very well continue to add jobs for the next few months. Let's all hope it, it does. So I think there is a, you know, from Austin's perspective as a policymaker, there's an immediate um, potential for job creation and manufacturing that, that actually does seem quite promising, but Martin's talking more about the fundamental 10-year productivity versus demand trends. So there, that's part of the tension. Can we move now to some solutions, something positive? What can we actually do to change, I think, what, what we must all conclude is really rather a grim picture. And maybe we'll start with you, Byron, since you were involved with the report. Um, you know, can we actually turn this around? And I know McKinsey is known for its optimism, and we had some, some uh, solutions laid out just now, but build on that a little bit more, and particularly build on the skill mismatch area, because that's what I'm going to come back to to the other panelists. I think that's a really fundamental issue. So what, what actually can be done? I think that we need uh, really revolutionary innovation in skill development and education itself. And I think that is absolutely possible. So there, there are... Um, there are, at the margins, tremendous uh, advances in learning technologies, adaptive, adaptive learning. For example, um, in DARPA, in the Defense Department, they have, uh, they have a, a sort of an adaptive learning program that can uh, train uh, sort of IT support people in a matter of weeks that's normally done in, in sort of a two-year program, and it does it extremely effectively. Um, the, the education sector has the least R&D of any sector of the economy at a time when we need the most innovation in that sector. I mean, that is a, that is a, a tremendously important enabling sector for the economy. So, so what would you do differently? Um, one of the things is throughout the education system, we measure progress through seat time. We say, how long are you sitting there, um, quote unquote, being educated? We should be measuring it by competencies. We should say, what, do you, what have you actually learned? What do you know how to do? If we measured it by competencies, then we would create a whole set of incentives um, for people to learn faster, to learn better, for them to learn in different ways, some learning in the classroom, some learning on the job, some learning through apprenticeships. And there, if you, so if you create that right policy structure and then let uh, innovators go after it, there can, in fact, be a revolution in learning. There is a, there is a, there is a you know, Carl's point about you can't, sort of have someone out of work for two years and then, uh, you know, and then spend uh, two years in college, there are ways, and even the best education institutions today do it. One, one, um, one uh, really interesting development just in the last week, um, I don't know if you, you saw it, the, the Manufacturing Institute uh, teamed up with Skills for America's Future. This is sort of a business and government and educational partnership to aim to train 500,000 people in those skills gaps in manufacturing. And one of the, the most interesting things about it, and they also teamed with a couple of foundations, Gates and Lumina, what they did is they, they, they've defined um, the skill ladder so that sort of all manufacturers could agree on it, so that it creates this mobility. We talked about the lack of mobility of the workforce. Um, you can go through community colleges, you can learn on the job, and you can then actually uh, fill, those, fill those skills and be mobile. So I, I think there actually are a lot of solutions there. And I think actually across um, skills, share, speed, spark, there are actually a number of, of very powerful solutions that can get us to uh, the results we want. Uh, 
let me, um, let me throw a bit more cold water on that. I just spent some time looking at the history of US training programs, um, which is a rather grim reading, actually, um, overall. They haven't broadly been that successful. And not only does the US spend m way less than virtually any other OECD country on training, that which it does spend, by all accounts, is not enormously well organized or efficient. So um, that, that's my journalistic cursory reading of it. But Martin and then, and then uh, Laura, I mean, one, one key part of getting to this um, much better outcome that Byron describes is to improve training, to improve retraining, and to do so in an environment, as Charlie Cobb started this his depressing talk before lunch, in an environment of, of fiscal retrenchment, in an environment where there aren't a huge amount of extra resources on the table. So Martin, how do we go about doing that? Uh, well, it's a tough one. Um, it, it's not easy, but I think in principle we can. Let me, let me just uh, uh, expand it for a second on, on what Byron said and, and what the armed forces do. Now, the, the armed forces can't outsource their job, and we don't have, use mercenaries, okay? So this has got to be done. Uh, it, obviously, people are stationed overseas, but this is an American activity, um, number one, and they can't pay you know, huge salaries to people uh, to do the job. So they have, they're forced, they have the necessity, they have to take the recruits that they have and train them to give them the skills that they need to operate what's a pretty high tech uh, system. And so they found ways to do that. So this necessity has been, in, to use the cliche, the mother of invention. They have found ways to go about it. And so somehow we have to change the, the incentives within the the private sector here in the U.S. so that there's more uh, willingness for business and, and maybe the, the, the public sector as well, not necessarily at the federal level, uh, but community colleges, uh, state, uh, uh, states and, and localities, uh, to figure out how to provide the skills that businesses need so that they can take those people and then give them uh, additional skills of, of, of what that particular firm or company uh, wants. And this is certainly not going to be easy. Um, but there are some, you can look at the record and find some signs of hope. There are some community colleges that are really good at what they do. And one of the examples was uh, shown earlier from the McKinsey report, Delta Airlines and, and other companies have actually partnered with community colleges to tra create uh, training programs so that their, their students uh, can come out and, and work in call centers or work, work for the company. So that's the kind of model uh, that we need to need to do. So how does it do? How do we do it? Well, uh, here we are at CED. Uh, I would, uh, I would, I'm very pleased that we're here in, uh, with this group uh, because this is a group that I think we need to create a kind of summer tech for improving educational technology to, to get a better handle on what it is that, uh, um, that, that students and, and re-employing workers, what skills they really need to have how could this be done cheaply, not uh, really expensive education and training programs, but fairly quick uh, programs? And then can we uh, work with uh, community colleges, not, not letting the bad ones get in the way, but trying to find uh, those common grounds so that, that uh, both on the education side and on the private sector side, uh, we can create these short-term uh, skill enhancement programs uh, that make people uh, better able to fit into these jobs. I don't uh, pretend that's an easy task, but surely if we really are in this economic crisis and if it's really true, uh, as Carl just said, that we have these skill shortages, shouldn't that give some urgency uh, around, do around doing something like this? Carl, what's your take on it as, as from the private sector perspective? What, what, when, you, when, you, when you face this uh, situation where you just don't have the people to fill the kinds of positions that you need, what, what would be helpful to you there? What do, you, do you think that Martin is on the right track here? Yeah, several things. You know, we have a very schizophrenic set of policies. You know, we don't have an education system that produces the workers we need, and we don't have an immigration policy that lets us bring them in and then we chew on the companies who then outsource the work to other countries where the workers are. Something's got to give in, the, you know, in, that, in that triangle. So first off, we don't, have, um, we don't have a lot of effort behind outcomes-based organization of education. We organize against what's convenient for those of us who are in the professor core. We organize by methods of education. 
Uh, we don't organize against an outcome. When we approach community colleges, and I've had some of the bad experiences where we were working with an automotive manufacturer who had guaranteed jobs, needed to add two classes to a curriculum that existed, and then they would be ready to go to work as soon as they graduated. Uh, we were told that'll take two years to get state approval for the new curriculum to be put in place, then we'll have to work on budgets, find the right type of instructors, and by the time they laid out the timeline, we said, well, there's no guarantee those jobs will still exist you know, by the time you, f you finish the time. So speed to action is missing very much in a lot of the taxpayer, um, you know, a lot of the taxpayer-supported education system. I also would note we're not talking about high schools. High schools used to be and can still be a place to develop a tremendous number of vocationally trained workers. We let ourselves get trapped into a view that that was discriminatory or it was tracking or we were profiling workers. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of skills that could be provided if we returned, you know, vocational education tracks back into the high school system where it's been, you know, excised. And I think there is much that could be done, um, but I, you know, I argue strongly that a role that the business and the, the business community could play is not only to say where the skills are, but how do we go about restructuring aspects of the educational distribution system to make it more quick and to uh, produce results, you know, with less expense. Andy, well, what's your perspective on this? I mean, how satisfied are you with the current panoply of, you know, training and advancement opportunities that are there, and where would you put the focus for going forward? Well, I mean, first of all, I think we should appreciate this is the easy place we all like to talk about. You know, we focus on a small number of high skill jobs, you know, where we might be able to solve the problem, but we've been unable to do it. So can I, I'll give you six things we need to do, I think, to answer these. One is American workers need a raise. We have a maldistribution of the income that is being, the growth that is being produced. Work has to pay. That's the nature of the American story. It's not paying. People haven't gotten a raise for 30 years. They've coped with it by putting a second member of their family to work. They've coped with it through home equity. They need a raise. They need to have consumption because they have money in their pocket and too much of the consumption is going to a certain group of people. Two is I would argue, and McKinsey can do this study, that the reason there is less innovation and less new job performance is we have monopolies coming back into our economy. This is the most concentrated business uh, ec you know, society that we've had since Reagan let loose on a lot of the antitrust stuff. You don't have innovation and new business development in monopolistic economies. We have to solve that problem. We need a pro-American trade policy when 90% of the Microsoft software and the Chinese government is pirated in the government. You know, China has a pro-China trade policy. Germany has a pro you know, we have a very idealistic trade policy that's not pro-American, and I'm not talking against trade, I'm saying a pro-American trade policy. We have an employer-based healthcare system that's ridiculous, it costs 6% more of GDP. Give us 6% more of GDP in this country, we can solve our budget and deficit. We don't want to talk about it. Pick Switzerland, pick France, pick Germany, pick Taiwan. There are ways that every company around this room who operates internationally is perfectly satisfied of getting benefits, and the same thing's true with retirement. And the VAT tax, which every other country uses in the world to prefer have preferences for exports rather than and, and penalizes imports, we don't. So we have a plan that guarantees that we will not succeed, and we don't want to talk about a lot of these things, so we talk about education. Laura, you, you know, former dean of UC Berkeley Business School, what, from that vantage point, is the American education system failing American workers? Well, I, I want to start with uh, a, a note of sympathy for what Andy just said in the following sense. Uh, I've been involved in discussion of U.S. competitiveness since about the time the phrase, the term was first uh, introduced. Back in 1983, it was President Reagan's uh, Council on Competitiveness headed by John Young. You will know President Reagan, I was a Democrat, but it was a bipartisan council. At the top of every competitiveness list since that time, has appeared macroeconomic conditions and the education of the U.S. workforce. And by most many, many, many measures, the education of the American workforce has not improved. 
So I, I really think it's very important here to say that if we agree that this is a key issue, then we've really got to change the game. And in that sense, I'm agreeing, in a sense, with, with Byron, that the, that the models just have to change. I actually also agree with something you said, that we spend uh, much less as a share of GDP on any training uh, than uh, other countries. And, and this is, we, we should recognize that, because one of the things I, I will say, again, to go back to something Austin said, as we are cutting the size of government and cutting government spending, we better be really careful of those areas where we believe, and the business community believes, because they've said it for 30 years, the government actually enhances competitiveness and job performance. Infrastructure spending, research and development spending, and education spending. And in education spending, training's there. Those are all parts of the discretionary, non-security discretionary budget. The focus of the biggest spending cut focus because it's politically easy to do. So just, I want to get that out there because we will not solve any of these problems without revolutionary changes, but if we kind of slash everything governments do, and state and local governments are having to slash that, those, those numbers about employment and education, if we now look at those in education going forward, well, I know what's happening in the state of California. People know what's happening in states around the country. Those employment numbers are actually declining now. Um, but so, what do I, now having said that, because I think it's just important, we've got to be serious here. So it's been mentioned that I'm a member of the President's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness. And, and here I want to, I really want to throw back now some optimism because, and, and there are probably business leaders in the room like this, the, the CEOs and business leaders in that group are absolutely trying to think about things that they can do on their own, in partnership with other companies, in partnerships with community colleges, and I'm very sorry to hear about the bad experience here, uh, in partnerships with state and local governments to really grab the skill issue. To sort of say, no, we cannot wait any longer. We have to do this. So I, I'm, I'm, I think you, you set up a plan, and, and the council is very plans oriented. It's sort of like, okay, what can we do in the first one to two years to help catalyze job creation? very focused on training and retraining and working with community college, very focused on figuring out ways to increase the retention rate of students who start out in engineering degrees and then drop out. If you could do something in, the, in a few years, in one to two years, to sort of take this pool of potential engineers and keep them there, that would be fantastic as a one to two year. So you've got to sort of get a plan, you've got to get the time frame. Uh, so on the revolutionary side of change here, um, you know, I do think that uh, institutions of higher education are going to have to think about this. When I was involved in this report, I was thinking about it, business schools, and if you notice the majors, the majors are first business, second social science, uh, then you have a pretty substantial fall off to STEM. Well, you know, business uh, schools can do more, particularly in undergraduate training, with requiring students to do more math and science, more quantitative methods, sort of get more uh, dual, minor, major degree programs, which give people the kind of skills they need more effectively. So that, that's a, a, an idea that, that came to mind. Um, I also, though, do think, because the other chart that I thought was really sobering here, is uh, the excess supply of high school and high school dropouts. You know, the charts are showing that over the next, between now and 2020, the U.S. has basically stopped dead in terms of improving uh, educational attainment levels, in terms of share of the population with a given degree. We were building up the share of the population with college education year after year after year. If you look at those numbers right now, nothing. If you look at what happens with high school and high school dropouts, we have this huge excess supply. Part of the problem here is that's where the wage, that's where there's no wage growth, where there's actually wage decline. So we actually, I think, have to do much more with bridging high schools and technical training. I, I really think, and, and, and that can be done faster than changing the way college majors are organized in traditional universities. So we should focus on that. Can I just say, Absolutely. just as a source of, of optimism here, um, it's, it's important to understand, like, you know, if we haven't made much progress in education since the 1980s, um, there's 20 countries in the world 
that have passed us in that time. So you can think about that as negative for the United States, but what it tells you is it can be done, right? I mean, it's not as if, it, this is not, it's not some law of physics that we can't improve our education system, right? I mean, there are, there are many countries that have done it. By the way, there are many countries that treat vocational education with a, with a rigor and a, uh, and a social status that is, ve that is very different than, than our country and where the, the, they're much more successful. And there, there are countries that have changed their system. I would point to Germany, which had its own uh, big uh, unemployment crisis um, in, the, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and systematically changed what was essentially a system to manage unemployment into an employment system. They moved from an unemployment system to an employment system. They integrated the, the, the unemployment insurance system with the workforce training system, with the job placement system, so that from the moment you lost your job in Germany, you had the system working to diagnose and to help you figure out how to get back into long-term employment. And that is a doable thing. We've seen how that can be done. There's, there's gotta be an American version of that working between federal, state governments, and you've seen other countries. Australia has changed its system quite dramatically, where it's very, the training system, where it's very outcomes-based. Instead of now paying to train people, no, you pay for job placement, and training is integrated to, into that. And the, the providers can be, they can be uh, state governments, it can be nonprofits, it can be for-profits, and there's, a, there's an outcomes-based, and a, a lot of, actually a lot of countries in Europe that we think of being more uh, sort of public sector oriented have gone to very mixed systems, but they, the, the, the common element is that they're both willing to spend on um, this uh, employment system and um, they're willing to do whatever it takes. They, they provide, it's outcomes based. And we haven't made that move in the United States yet. And if we do, I think we can make huge progress.